Good day, folks. I'd like to talk to you today about the Don Smith method and his secret. You see, he gives us a lot of examples, and basically uh, where I've been led with my one wire system is very similar to what he was saying in his own way. So I'm going to try and take the time to show you the similarities and what's going on here and the system and methods that maybe Don Smith forgot to mention. I don't know if it was intentionally, but I will try and explain what he doesn't explain, and maybe it's going to help people understand the process better. So, um, the way Don Smith, you know, the famous way of looking at it is he'll have his Tesla coil here. I'm going to try and draw. This would be his secondary coil here. Not the best drawer I know. Okay, and here's his little dome here, and that's his Tesla coil that he's driving here, but his primary, and there's his high frequency, high voltage generator, he, he says it's a neon, you can use any, and there's your input, usually 12 volts. DC. This could be a battery. So now he has the spark gap assembly here. And essentially, this is crudely the method he, like a normal Tesla coil, right? And his point is you put a capacitive plate, let's say here and these waves will energize magnetically this capacitive plate here and you just need to put your load here and then this goes to ground you're doing the pure potential difference that i was talking about using essentially wirelessly the one wire system okay now his point which is very similar to mine, is there doesn't seem to be a limit of how many of these plates, if you want to place them strategically nearby, of how many taps you can get, and whichever voltage potential difference you get against ground, they're all going to be as individual systems, not stressing the high frequency generator more at the input, but yet you have all the, these outputs. So what happens is if you're you for example you're using these to charge capacitors with and you time like Don Smith does with a very basic 60 Hertz switch these discharges that could all accumulate into a common point here which I'll just call switch And this runs our 60 Hertz compatible load. This is essentially, um, without going into a lot of details, how he and various methods of doing this and filtering out the high frequency transients and switching at the end with the capacitive discharges that's 60 hertz because the more capacitors you add that gives you those amps a second discharges and if you could um, re-gauge them all without stressing the input essentially what we're doing is an artificial steady state dynamic system like Tom Bearden was talking about when he's talking about um, electrostatics and magnetic static magnetic fields well, we're doing the electric version of that. So we're providing a small trigger. It's continuous. Let's say we're using 1.5 amps. That 1.5 amps stays continuous. It doesn't matter how many here. We're still using the 1.5 amps. Now, of course, like in my demonstration, I did a little differently. Both will work. They have advantages and disadvantages. And let me explain here.
See, the way I've been doing it is feeding directly off the capacitive part here. So this would be your Tesla coil, but I got one wire here and I keep it going and I do a various things with this, either coils or just a rod, but the point is it doesn't connect to anything and I have various induction methods all around this rod here. So what happens is these here are all getting energized and if they have rectifiers, let's say one wire systems, these become all their own, let's say 22 UF each charging that up. But what happens is even though in this way they still don't stress the additional input, what will stress the additional input somewhat is the more of a capacitive or inductance you add here changes the variables in your resonant condition. So what happens is you might be loading it capacitively and inductive. So you might actually end up having to use a little more continuous input if everything is still connected directly. So um, obviously this one will provide a stronger charge and you might need more mechanism because you're going to be dealing with high voltages this would be like my quantum energy generator version 2. I needed to use spark gap tubes between all of these because it was coming in pretty strong. But at the price that you're going to use a little bit more. But it's still going to be a, a steady state because the, the energizer is going to use whatever it needs. It's going to match itself to the condition of the inductance and capacitive you have. And from that point on, if that's your goal, that, that's fine. But I'm just saying, if you're really concerned about the conservation of your generator and the whole idea is to use the less power, you would want to decouple completely and go right on the wireless side like Don Smith was doing. It might not be as powerful, but what happens is you make up for it with the potential differences from the earth and you use that to charge capacitors and you pulse that and it's very quick that you're going to see gains one way or the other folks depending on what you want to do but um, Don Smith had a point here when he was strictly talking about the input load so we might ask ourselves okay then why when somehow it becomes RF according to traditional electrodynamics even if or wirelessly coupled into it, whatever energy we're taking from this has to come from the input load, right? But we all know that when we're dealing with radio, the thing is we, there's a lot with magnetics, and even Tom Bearden explained this, that we still don't know about. We know of a lot of effects, but there's a lot of it, there's about half of it all that we still don't know very clearly how it interacts and what it, every system does. But what we do know is some anomalies. So um, I'm going to explain to you wirelessly in very simple terms here what Don Smith um, noticed and probably many ham operators quietly as well just don't want to talk about it because it'll sound like the nut here. So let's simulate a traditional RF system here. So let's say we have a hill here, a big mountain top. And we have a radio tower here. Okay. We'll say this is an FM station. FM. And we have our city down here. And these are all our high rises. So we have the big city down here. And then the little buildings. And then the outskirts as we get out of town here. So we'll just say quickly from here to here would be 60 miles, okay? Now a lot of people for some reason seem to think that there is huge power in wireless devices, radio frequency that's gonna scramble our brains, it's gonna kill us. I hate to be the bearer of bad news here, but there's a lot less energy than what a lot of people think, even when it comes to energy harvesting and practically why this is not a thing. When we work with radio systems, we measure this in microvolts per meter square. 
And there's the key, microvolts. It's very, very little power. So for example, if this FM station would want to cover 60 miles of urban environment, they would need at minimum 50,000 watts just to make it to the other side and have some penetrative power left. So what I'm getting at is at 60 miles, your power sensitivity on a most perfect system, which you could probably never get, but very close. But let's say in the best case scenario, you're going to get maybe um, uh, 0 0.5 micro volts per meter square. You know how little that is. I mean, never mind trying to power an LED. That's 60 miles away. Now let's say you want to have perfect urban downtown coverage. Now in Canada, anyways, that's rated at three microvolts per meter. Yes, three. So maybe the first 20 miles here, they'll have what they call the city grade contour, which will be zero, sorry, three microvolts per meter square. You're 20 miles away from a 50,000 watt station and the best you could do with the most resonant antenna is pull 3 microvolts. That's with the perfect system, folks. So that's why if you actually want to pull a volt or two from a high-powered station, you have to literally be under the shadow of the tower to get 1 or 2 volts. Because as soon as you get to maybe a quarter mile away, you're down into the microvolts. So what I'm getting at is the FM or any radio station, they maximize the electromagnetic field to go propagate very far. But to be able to do that, there's a cost that it costs them. That's their steady state. Then, you know, the steady state is always 50 kilowatts. It doesn't change, that's how much power they're putting in because instead of us working with little transformers a few inches away to couple, these people need to excite a field, you know, 60 miles away. So they need all that power just to get a little excitement of 0 0.5 microvolts per meter too all the way over here. Needless to say, a good radio receiver has sensitivity into the UV range like a couple UVs like two three UVs some car vehicles will above you'll have some noise but you'll be able to hear it so what I'm getting at is that as small as it is that three UV is interacting with something to feed it three UV without actually stressing so that the input is not all of a sudden putting out 50 kVs plus 3 UV because it's got one listener. Can you imagine if there's like, let's say, you know, this town is a few million like New York and you've got 1.5 million listening to your station, you wouldn't have enough power if they're all coupling the field and draining like we would think it would. Radio wouldn't work because as soon as too many people go in, tune into it, well, they'd be taking a minuscule amount of input, which is very true, that appears at the receiver. But where's the power coming from, folks? This is what Don Smith talks about, but doesn't get into the explanation as to the whys. And I will explain to you the why here. So I don't know if you've watched it, but a few videos ago I talked about, you know, how every radio field automatically has the sum zeros, the scalar waves are all looking for to interact with the vacuum in the environment. So when you've got an RF wave, essentially it's a form of AC, which comes like this, right? So that's my radio wave here. So if you go like this, like a normal, like you would look at it, you see that the sum zeros are already built in part with any regular radio waves which means without doing anything special to it we already have a partial interaction with the sum zeros it's built into every wave and at these intervals here this is where the interaction happens with the vacuum here and if we follow along with the um, heavy side component 
This is essentially a way to encode the information. May have waited. You know what I'm getting at? Like the heavy side is being encoded into an RF field so that at the input, as long as it has any kind of, in the UV ranges even, it's receiving a much smaller version of that wave. Well, guess what? It still has the sum zeros that appear, like Tom Bearden was saying, at the local load coming right from the environment or the vacuum interacting with these sum zeros. So my point I'm making is the reason in radio frequencies we're not actually draining the input load, we're not overdriving the transmitters, we're, is because at every receiver end we interact in part with the vacuum as well at the receiver load. We're just using the wave as a trigger to kickstart this process. The sum zeros are already encoded in the wave. So this is how Don Smith, not, it might not be the only interaction because there's a lot we don't know, but in part this is a big one as to an explanation as to why in RF systems a super good radio wouldn't just simply kill the load. Can you imagine, you know, like even the military applications for communications, if it was that easy, an enemy could just build a crude LC circuit that operates at the multitudes of the frequencies of the control channel, and it didn't matter if, you know, you're running a thousand watt, a million watts, the LC circuit would just suck the whole power and there'd be no communications. It just, it doesn't work that way. As much as we think it should work that way in, ele in traditional electrodynamics, it doesn't account for the sum zero interactions with the vacuum here. So um, I'm just trying to explain to you the possible interaction. And with that said, it opens the door to um, um, a lot of what uh, to Don Smith didn't want to talk about. He had a few black boxes, which he claimed uh, operated under the same principles. And I will show you what I came up with. And I'm working on it, and you'll see some of the um, um, photos as I progress. And I will explain to you the process here. So here's something which I called the magnetic flux the magnetic flux triode tube Now you might wonder why that kind of a crazy name, right? Well, in the traditional tube where you have the um, anode and cathode and the control grid and manipulating your energy systems, this is what I mean by the triode. Now, I will show you a device here, possibly in the line of what Don Smith was doing. And uh, the thing, folks, with the Don Smith method is I think what he was trying to do is show us the effect without necessarily showing us the details of how to maximize that. So the way he shows it with the Tesla coils and the capacitive plate is very practical to show the effect, but when you're actually trying to use it like that as a power source, you see how it gets bulky, you're limited in space, you can only put a few plates around, and even if you start putting all these extra coils all around, this thing starts taking a lot of room very quickly. And I haven't really seen anyone successfully, as is, get into the heart of it. And he does say there's something else to it, but it's all based on these ideas. So I just thought about it and came up with the magnetic flux triode tube. So let me explain to you how it works. So um, as I explain here, um, it's best to couple indirectly. So a better way to do that is true magnetics or the ion valve. So you have your high voltage, high frequency. I'm going to do that again. Your high voltage, high frequency generator right here. 
And then what happens is you want whatever the output is, um, you want to couple into it magnetically. So I'm going to use an ion valve like setup here to do that. So where you got a bar in the middle and this plate here. So now we have the one wire output here. So now instead of like I was doing, just feed an output from here, this is where it's interesting, you see, because here in this example we use the ion valve, so we're disconnected even from the one wire system. It's completely magnetically coupled. So right from the start we take advantage of the sun zeros in the field to help us energize our ion valve. This could be a transformer, you won't have the ion interactions as efficiently, but one or the other, there's more than one ways of doing it, so I'm just trying to show you one method here. However you want to drive the magnetic flux triode tube is up to you. So how do you build it? Well, what I did is I took a, a fluorescent light bulb here, and at the input of the bulb, we have the one wire system which causes a glow in the bulb. Now the output of this, so anyways, um, that's the first part, and then I have one layer of foil tape all around here with a wire tap that comes out, and what happens is we have also a dielectric, I wanted to use dielectric resonance, so I used the um, electric tape, because in a lot of these energy projects, especially the unique magnetic fields, there's multiple coils with um, vinyl in between and that causes interesting um, dielectric resonance as well. So I wanted to take advantage of both systems there. So and then we, we, we put a, a layer of electrical tape to seal this and create a dielectric. And then again another layer of foil tape and then a second wire so this becomes capacitor number one and then again another layer of electrical tape and then we where we have the output here this feeds coil all around magnetic wire thousands of turns all around the tube here and then again another layer of electrical tape and then another um, plate, which is a foil tape all around that. One other leg here for contact. Another layer of electrical tape. Another layer of foil tape. Another tab here. And then another layer of tape. And then another coil here that connects to the last coil. and. There's no limit. You just keep layering it like that and your last coil is going to be left open. That's it. No closing the loop. And these capacitive plates be now become all your individual outputs. So all we need to do is switch these into either the built-in capacitance, if it's enough, or charge smaller capacitors at high voltage. And we switch this at 60 hertz. Of course, a little bit of filtering here to get rid of the high frequency transients. That could be a simple um, coil and capacitor type filter before the switching and then on the output is where you get your current without stressing the input so the more current you want keep layering and layering and layering and layering until you have 20 capacitors they won't stress your input so that's pretty well the key there and uh, the sky is the limit the high frequency high voltage generators it could be Tesla coils, it could be flyback oscillators, it could be uh, old um, 
neon transformers the sky is the limit but remember though that at every stage here when you use a diode rectifier you want to go against the real ground here because that's where you're true then you can end up having 200 volts or more even if carefully set up and this is what you want and your switching can handle it it would be even more efficient in the kilovolts if you could find a way to switch it I have been having a hard time myself switching anything over 200 volts with sold states so that's a limit there for the um, transistorized switching but I'm sure somebody who's clever could find a way to switch this at extremely high voltages and that's where your kilowatts will come in for like amps of input so um, I hope I cleared the air here and this is I think what in part Don Smith was up to and was covering up at the end because it makes the whole system a lot more portable because it's just a tube so all right let's try and frame this in Tom Bearden terms here so the first rule would be we need to break the symmetry so first thing first is we need to break it so we break the symmetry because what happens in regular traditional electrodynamics you got half of the system that's always in equilibrium with the other working against it so we need to break the symmetry so that could be right at our oscillator by uh, varying the potential differences and by using an electromagnetic field or magnetic flux by doing that or breaking the symmetry now what's next we need to offer non-linear systems so that could be diodes like for example the one wire system which leads us to what else does he say keep the loop open so we must keep the system open loop So the other thing he talks about is the regaging, specifically asymmetrical regaging. So we'll just say we'll call it looping, as he calls it regaging, but in essence we're doing that. So all right. Let's put it like let's try and give it a visual we could understand so let's say this is a circle wheel bad drawer I'm sorry and then we have our vehicle here which would be our electrical power goes all around the wheel here and which if we're looking at traditional electrodynamics you give it a pulse it might go once it might go twice it'll start slowing down because it's got the equivalent of the EMF drag plus the air and everything and eventually it will just slow right down right now what happens if we break the symmetry now and we let it all of a sudden instead of providing an electrical DC to the device as a battery we send the field all around here now what happens is we still have to pay a little bit to introduce the static field here but now what's gonna happen is when we give it that push it's gonna go all around and if we have a mechanism to couple into the field during the time it goes around once let's say we're using uh, capacitors the system builds up a charge and once maybe there could be a switch a clutch or something here and when it gets to that all of a sudden we offer asymmetrical regaging that high voltage sudden pulse poof gives it all that momentum and all of a sudden makes it across then all of a sudden charges again 
discharges poof. And this is the concept here in Tom Bearden terms that we're looking after here. And and the way we're doing it with the Don Smith setup, we're doing exactly all of this. So again, Tom Bearden had it right, but sometimes he has ways of explaining things which seem to be overly complicated. So I hope that this sort of, again, clears the ideas here. So again, Good day folks, I'd like to show you some other possibilities dealing with the one wire system or how to drive it. I realize from variants of uh, Tesla-like coils with inductance to ion valves for the high voltage and hybrids of both seem to be a good way to work with this. So here's what I did here, is I just used the regular Tesla coil and this is the valve here. And uh, what I did is I, I surrounded the outside with tin foil. Um, tape basically and I uh, just this is my core here you see most people the way they will drive this is they will use their um, generator to uh, pulse the capacitor and spark gap in the closed loop and then use this uh, primary coil and then drive the Tesla coil I'm sort of doing it in reverse all with one wire using this core here at high frequency kind of like the ion valve in the middle and I just drive it with the one wire here of the generator. So what I do is one tap is the coil going into one of the one wire systems. Another tap is the uh, capacitive plate or you know the ion valve on one side which feeds. What I've done is going into a um, fluorescent lamp on one side and then the other side um, goes to ground and um, I've put a plate another foil tape around here and I'm also using that on the one wire so I got a total of three of them now and they all independently work great without stressing the input load because they're all on one wire now curious it seems like I could layer all these plates here and use extra taps and stack them up so that's going to be my next project and uh, I'm probably going to connect relays and I'll show you later but anyways um, I'll turn this on now to show you what happens here I'll just connect the ground on this side here just having it touching that okay good enough so I'm going to turn on the generator and as you see the light blows pretty thanks to the uh, ground here so this is working fine all on one wire and if we turn on our meter over here they all put out a lot of voltage so this one here and this one there so we're already at uh, one two hundred here. So that's how quick these are charging. So I'm going to have to turn it off now because it's going to exceed because we're not switching it. But that's the whole idea. All of these are pulling in like this one here. If I were to connect direct, I get over a thousand volts on it. So you put a small cap if you're not greedy, you know, and the multiple of them and pulse, and that's where you're going to get a lot of energy output. So these are just the variants. Um, it's a work in progress. I'll keep making this video and show you what I have in mind. I'm going to try and layer multiple plates and all have their own one wire tap and have them all charge their own capacitor. So now I'm going to measure the capacitance of every plate here and see what I get. I am curious. Let's try with the yellow one. See, I coated them all with tape as I went along, so I knew which pair belonged. Hey, not bad, 500 PF for 
what it is. Let's see how the other one goes. This is the red one. Wow, 1,100 PF for that one. Because the coil gets bigger and bigger with every layer, so it's only normal that some of them will have different capacitive readings. 632 PF, this one. All right, so that looks like it's going to work. So I'm going to try and wire it up with some crude circuit and take some readings here. All right, here's the final product so far all done. I've got all of these uh, taps, so many of them that I don't have all the parts needed to actually couple into them. But it does to show the proof of concept here. So I've got one tap here, which is one capacitor, 22 UF, and it charges almost instantly to over 200 volts. And this is real current, folks. I mean, this stuff could potentially kill you. So it's not a good idea at all to have it all laying out like this. But I understand, you know, myself and others have to build it first. But I have to stress, once you do have the configuration, none of this should be exposed. Very, very dangerous. So with that said, um, I'll proceed. And, exp and here's another tap here because I got a lot of them. And the difference with this one is I'm connecting it to ground to show you the difference between using the pure potential of ground and just passive, which both of them will work very well. But at the end result, you want to ground. And I want to show you the difference here. So basically, this is, like I said, it's just the uh, an ion valve like. And I'm just coupling into the capacitive plate, feeding the input of the tube. And then I've got, you know, one coil lining up to the other and just crossing like that every coil acts as an energizer with the last coil loop here left open so everything is open loop and nothing is directly connected each capacitive plate acts as a one wire system here so i'm going to turn it on and you're going to notice my tube lights up here and we're going to have the voltmeter and i'm going to take a reading of the capacitor here and there's the capacitor it charges pretty quickly so I already have to kill it because I'm over the rating because we're not switching it I'm actually having issues with the switching mechanisms because even at 200 volts it seems to be too much for any transistor I've got here so but I guess that's the least of our worries at this point. And I will show you how very real this energy is, okay? So I'm going to discharge the cap here. And I mean, this could really harm you if you're not careful, folks. Look at this. That's a pretty big snap, isn't it? So that's real amps a second discharges right there. And now that I've just charged it, I'll turn it back on and I'll take a measurement from this one here with the ground to show you the difference here. So we're going to turn this back on. It's back on. So I'm going to take a measurement of just pure potential difference. And look at my meter. Nearly a thousand volts here. Almost out of range for my meter. So what that means is I don't have these, but if I had like 20 uh, microwave capacitors, I could link them all up to the one wire system. I'll have their own rectifiers, ground them, and pulse them with a um, an essential a switch at 60 hertz into a transformer and all of those discharging at a thousand volts let's say uh, 20 UF Wow you know and I must put emphasis on the Wow so this is all working and I got so many taps here and I don't know what to do with them folks so anyways um, 
we're left at switching so um, I'm probably going to look at probably solid state high voltage relays of sorts so anyway I just wanted to show you the concept it works and I've released a PDF which has all the details on how to build this with completed schematics of a potential system that could actually be made into application and I describe all the theory as much as I know it so please uh, download the PDF file if that interests you okay so Thank you very much for watching.